And we have about 10 minutes, uh, a little less, uh, and we're going to um, uh, do two things. One, we're going to open it up for questions for about four minutes, and then we're going to go for a lightning round uh, from our panelists who are going to uh, basically ad uh, address the following. We're going to assume uh, that Stephen Shaw is the head of CMS. Uh, we're going to assume uh, that um, uh, the system resources will ne neither grow nor shrink uh, in terms of the dollars involved uh, in the foreseeable future. And we're going to assume that he doesn't have to worry about any clearance processes. And we're going to make suggestions to him uh, on uh, what one or two things should he set in motion in preparing for going big with respect to fostering a payment model that could yield uh, the best value uh, in the context of what we've been talking about today. So the, the, the lightning round will be on payment. Uh, you'll have to be brief because if you uh, tried to engage the whole issue, it would uh, go on far too long. Uh, and let's open it up uh, for other questions uh, in the meanwhile. Yes, Reverend. Could you announce yourself? Uh, uh, I'm Pastor Hanson from Iowa. Uh, that's a place out west. <laughs> um, live in a community of 800 and one mad dog. I was privileged to be asked to be on the, one of the three task force meetings and was invited back again today also was asked to be a reviewer for this report. I don't have a question. I just want to applaud you. Um, I have took care of my wife for 47 and a half years until she passed away this April from multiple medical issues. I fought from being kicked out of the room and left down the end of the hall all the way to finally being recognized as someone who knew something in the room in the intensive care before she died. What you've done is the beginning. What you folks have is the beginning. Please take it a lot further. I'm not a medical person. I'm a caregiver for a person who had multiple issues, from diabetes to stroke to breast cancer to seizures and finally dying of pneumonia. This is needed, and it's needed desperately in this country. The system is not totally broke, but boy, does it need to be developed and worked on. You guys have done great. Kudos to you. Anything I can do to help to further the cause, I really want to do, because it's desperately, desperately needed. And the other little comment is, please don't forget that 75% of this country is rural. 75% is small, little communities, Elderly people out there by themselves in communities of 800 or less who have to drive 80 to 100 miles to get medical care. And that's going gravel and windy roads. They aren't just down the block, and the pharmacy just isn't around the corner. And when you have medical issues in multiples, that gets to be a real problem, especially when you have doctors spread out over three different clinics or three different hospitals, and you have to travel all of that, plus getting the patient ready. It's going to take a lot of work, and you are desperately needed. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. We're so sorry for your loss. Uh, we're so grateful for your words of wisdom and inspiration throughout this process. Are there, yes? Last question before our lightning round. I'm Eleni O'Donovan. I'm a family doctor here in the District of Columbia. I work for Unity Healthcare, which is a large not-for-profit that runs a bunch of FQHCs here. Um, I have a question about a patient. So last year I had the um, opportunity to look at a Medicaid uh, claims data set just for from one of the local MCOs for our own patients. It was about 9,000 patients, and we were looking at super utilizers the way this MCO defined them, so that was five or more visits to the ER in a year. 
So the top utilizer had been 77 times. Um, she had also seen her PCP 24 times in that year. Um, and she was 27. And she was going for, she was, I don't think, one of the patients in this report, really, right? So she doesn't have CHF, she doesn't have diabetes. She was going mostly for sore throats, pregnancy tests, UTI symptoms, and back pain. So I guess my question is, is that another report? Is that another group? Um, because my guess is she is going to become one of these patients in about, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 20 years. Um, and I don't know how to keep her from becoming one of these patients, but certainly her utilization pattern is concerning. And we looked at lots and lots of these patients. Again, Medicaid claims data, so they're younger. Um, kind of different than I think what drove this taxonomy. So that's kind of my question. Is that a different report? Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have time for everybody to answer that, but if I could ask Bruce and Melinda just to offer brief comments. I think for sake of time, Linda, why don't you take the question? I think that she's part of our population. So when we talk about the heterogeneity of the population, so the one thing that I forgot to say is where the evidence is also lacking is that most of the, most of the good studies really do focus on elderly, and actually a ton of the high need, high cost are, are not elderly. They are homeless schizophrenics with diabetes, or they're just, you know, they're, they're just people with a lot of conditions, some functional limitations. So she would actually fit in, in you know, and I don't know exactly which group she would go into, um, Probably, but I think that, um, but she would be considered high need and certainly high cost, if that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, now let's um, ask, and we'll start actually with Susan and come this way uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, they'll be brief. Uh, the question is, uh, having the head of CMS, uh, Dr. Cha, in mind, uh, what should he set in motion in preparation uh, for going big with respect to payment model uh, that will yield dramatic improvements in the value of our dollar investments and accommodate the problems of this population? Susan? Uh, I think one way to uh, cut this is to look at um, a specific community having done an analysis of their particular um, uh, complex uh, uh, patients, and they found that um, moving the money, that spending money on either transitional and or permanent housing is actually yielding better health outcomes and uh, saving costs rather than the medical interventions that those not only savings should be accrued and kept by the housing services, but that the, the budgets actually get reallocated to reflect that. Thank you, Susan. So the major issue from your perspective uh, in this uh, process of reform is to build in a way of blending social services and uh, medical care payments. Yeah, I'll just echo, there's some really great demonstrations in Michigan showing what you can do just by insulating houses and putting in new windows. So it's a very good thought. Uh, look, I'm not, I have a lot of opinions about policy and payment, but I'm not an expert and I've learned not to uh, go beyond my expertise. Uh, but I, I do have two quick uh, stories uh, that, uh, see, I've been in IHI, so I'm into stories. Uh, I used to be in the data, and now I'm into stories. Uh, so I had, I had the uh, privilege of speaking to the CEO of Cerner uh, because uh, I, I was curious enough to go out there, and he bought me a, a steak and a glass of wine, and he said, we started at the wrong end. Uh, we started with a hospital to construct our platforms. We should have started with a patient and we'd be in a far better place today if we built this for patients and not hospitals. Uh, and um, I think there's uh, uh, some uh, real merit in that. And then uh, in the same uh, coffee shop line, I, I learned a lot in coffee shop lines where I heard about the individual and not the population health. Uh, somebody uh, uh, said to me that really you, you ought to be uh, starting with uh, what uh, patient uh, wants and needs, and uh, you people in America have a very funny way of defining value, and I don't understand it. You keep showing an equation that shows quality and, and, and cost, and to me, value has an S. 
Uh, and if you're not incorporating my personal values and preferences and contexts and conditions in which I struggle to uh, live and raise a family, then I'm not interested in your concept of values. So when you're doing this, add an S, and you'll probably come up with a better payment and policy system. Thank you, Don. Bruce? Uh, four things fast. Take the care tool that's been sitting around languishing inside CMS for gosh knows how long and actually create a tool that actually collect the data on functions so we didn't have to use the very weak measures we have. Build quality measures that you tie pay for performance to, whether it's fee-for-service, ACO, managed care. Um, add in a small, skinny uh, home and community-based services benefit into Medicare for very high needs Medicare only individuals and create the Medicare Medicaid as its own program. Carve them out of Medicare and Medicaid and let that office stand on its own. Thank you, Bruce. Melinda? Okay, week. so um, I was going to also talk about comprehensive capitated payments at the geographic level. What's really missing also is aligning not just the payments to the organization, but it's the organization, but also to the individual provider compensation, having that align, although that's not easy to do. I would echo what Susan said, is that um, allowing the payments to cover social services and allowing those social service expenses to count toward the baseline in the uh, in the in the next year so not just um, uh, segregating them out as non-medical spend um, increasing payment to primary care and then the other I was going to say is allow a home and community based benefit in Medicare but that's partially because we co-funded the study by the BPC that made that recommendation and we both really like it finally quality measures that include patient experience that get wrapped into the whether they're pay for performance or shared savings or the some kind of reward making sure that there's that patient and caregiver perspective Thanks to each of you. Please join me in uh, thanking our panelists.